Preface, second edition, revision one. Preface to the Et Sefer. This collection of the Et Sefer, pronounced Et Sefer, Sefer, rather, pronounced Et Sefer, divine book, sets forth the name of and makes references to our Creator as He identified Himself to us in His Holy Word and restores the names of people and places found in the original Ivriet Hebrew tongue, which have been transliterated into English. We make mention herein of the name Yahuwah. The name Yahuwah is a name that went unmentioned for over two millennia. The construct of these four letters is one that is common in modern Hebrew, modern Hebrew, where the Yod is pronounced with the vowel ah, creating Yah. This name stands alone as Yah, 45 times in the Tanakh. Exodus 15.2, Exodus 17.16, Psalms 68.4, Psalms 68.18, Psalms 77.11, Psalms 89.8, Psalms 94 7, Psalms 94 12, 102 18, 104 34, 105 45, 106 1, 106 48, 111 1, 112 1, 113 1, 113 9, 115 17, 18, 116 19, 117 2, 118, 5, 14, 17, 18, and 19, 122, 4, 133, 135, 1, 3, 4, and 21, 146, 1, 146, 10, 147, 1, 20, or rather 147, 1, and 20, Psalm 148, 1, and 14, Psalm 149, 1 and 9. Psalm 150, 1 and 6. Isaiah 12, 2. Isaiah 26, 4. And Isaiah 38, 11. In Shemot Exodus 3, 14, Elohim gives his name as Eya Asher Eya translated most basically as I am that I am or I will be that I will be then establishes the vocalization Yahua where the Vav is used in its vowel form as an ooh rather you rather than declaring the vowel as a jot beside the consonant he. So the yod is pronounced ya, and the he is pronounced with the vav as hu. This is easily recognized when you consider the transliterated name of many of the prophets, such as Yasha Yahu, Yerma Yahu, and so on. The Tetragrammaton concludes with a single he, which carries the same jot as the yod, that is, the mark ah. Therefore, the pronunciation is yahua or yahua. To ignore the ha at the end is a disservice, as in the pronunciation Yahweh, as the ha is the breath of the Father within his own name. This claim is supported with the following example concerning the change of the name of Avram to Avraham. Neither shall your et name any more be called Avram, 
but your name shall be Avraham. For a father of many nations have I made you. Barashit, Genesis 17.5 Here the Ha is breathed into Avram, and the covenant is expressed as an everlasting covenant. The breath of life was then poured into Avraham's wife, Sarai, who became Sarah, Barashit, Genesis 17, 15. For this reason, pronunciations such as Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahvo, or Yahvah are not widely disparate, rather disparate. Yahweh instead of Yahuwah, Yahweh instead of Yahweh. However, Yahuwah is the more accurate. We have set forth the name of Messiah as Yahushua. Partly because this name is identical to the name we have set forth in Bedibar, Numbers, describing the Ephraimi Husha, the son of Nun, who was selected as one of the twelve to spy out the promised land during the beginning of the Exodus. Bemid Bar, Numbers 13.8, of the tribe of Ephraim, Husha, the son of Nun. Bemid Bar, Numbers 13.16. These are the names of the men which Moshe sent to spy out at the land. And Moshe called Husha, the son of Nun, Yahushua. Rather, Nun, Yahusha. In the Masoretic text, you see the name Yahusha spelled in the Hebrew Yod, He, Vav, Shin, Vav, Ain, or Yahushua. Therefore, the assumption is that Moshe added not only Yah, the name of He, who visited Moshe at the burning bush, but also added the Vav to create Shua as the ending syllable. Strong's Hebraic, rather Strong's Hebrew Dictionary 7737 sets forth Shua as the word Shava. Its usage within the King James Version means to level, that is, equalize. Figuratively, to resemble, by implication, to adjust, that is, counterbalance, be suitable, compose, place, yield, etc. To avail, behave, bring forth, compare, countervail, be or make equal, lay, be or make alike, make plain, profit, or reckon. Therefore, the name Yahushua can be understood as Yah in the Ivrit Hebrew, which is the shortened name of the Father, Hu in the Ivrit, which means He, and finally Shua, which means make level or equal. Therefore, Yahushua means in this analysis, Yah is He who makes equal. The term Yah is found in 45 verses in the Tanakh, including Shemot, Exodus 15.2. Yah is my strength and song, and he is become my Yeshua. He is my El, and I will prepare him a habitation. My father's Elohim, and I will exalt him. Shemot. Exodus 15.2. Yahusha has a wonderful meaning. Strong's H3467 declares Yasha is used as a primitive root, meaning properly, to be open, wide or free, that is, by implication, to be safe, causatively, to free or succor, to avenge, 
defend, deliver, help, preserve, rescue, be, rather, to be safe, to bring or to have salvation, to save, or to be a savior, or to get victory. We have elected to publish the name Yahushua, rather, Yahusha, in the first instance, because it is the most accurate transliteration of the name given to the Messiah, as he was given the same name as Husha, Yahusha, son of Nun, whom the English world has always called Joshua. However, the name Yahushu, rather, Yahusha, means I am he who avenges, defends, delivers, helps, preserves, rescues, saves, brings salvation, your Savior, who brings you to victory. Another wonderful word we have elected to use in the text is the word Yahid, which in its use declares tremendous meaning. In its first use, we find it in Bashit with the instruction to Avraham saying, And he said, Take now at your son, your at Yahid, at Yitzhak, whom you love, and get you into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell you of. Bereshit, Genesis 22, 2. Yitzhak was not the firstborn, nor the only begotten son of Avraham, but he was nonetheless the Yahid. The word Yahid is not just reserved for describing sons, however, but also daughters. In Shofetim 1134, it is written, And Yiftak came to Mitzpah, unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his Yahiyada, rather, Yahidda. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. Shofetim, Judges 11.34. The Yahid is then better understood as the beloved child not necessarily the only begotten. Consider the comments of Shalama, who said in Mishlei as follows, For I was my father's son, tender and only Yahid in the sight of my mother. Mishlei, Proverbs 4.3. However, there are three passages which cannot be ignored where the word Yahid is applicable. It is these passages which gave rise to our editorial decision to include the word Yahid in these passages. O daughter of my people, gird you with sackcloth and wallow yourself in ashes. Make you mourning as for a Yahid, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. Yira Mayuhu, rather, Yira, rather, Yir Mi Yahu, Jeremiah 6.26. And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentations. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the mourning of a Yahid, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Amok, Amos 8.10 And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Yerushalayim the Ruach of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me at whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his Yahid and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Yakar Yahu, rather, Yakar Yahu, 
Zechariah 12.10. So it is with these considerations that we have made the following change. For Yah so loved the world that he gave at Yahid that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yahu Khanan, John 3.16. Consider also our use of another term, similar in nature to this term, yachid, but carrying with it additional meaning. This word we have elected to use is the term by which the Essenes called themselves, namely, yachad. This word, in its application, means to be one or to become one to join, or to unite. Yet it appears to be the joining of the word Yah and the word Echad, one. Yachad then means to be joined or to be united with Yah. Therefore we made the following change. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be yachad, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be yachad in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be yachad, even as we are yachad. Yahu Hanan, John seventeen, twenty through twenty two. Yesha Yahu Isaiah fourteen is well known as the only place in all of Scripture where some Bibles have substituted the name Lucifer, yet the name Lucifer, the light bearer, does not actually appear in the original Ivrit Hebrew. The original Ivrit indicates that there is no such name, and further, that it is an extrapolation of what may actually be the true name of the fallen angel. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Yashayahu, Isaiah fourteen twelve. The term, reading right to left, looks conspicuously like He Yad Lamed Lamed H Y L L or Hell. The pronunciation, however, places more vowels, yielding Hi Lel. There are but two angels identified in the Protestant Bible. Michael and Gabriel. Both names end with the identifier L. We have the same condition with Hilel, leading to the possible conclusion that the word is actually the name of an angel. In this case, possibly the fallen angel Hilel. There is another term in this passage worthy of discussion, which is the word Yalal. This word is not referenced or interpreted in any other English text besides this et sefer. The word means howling. Hence the phrase which formerly referenced Lucifer now reads as follows. How are you fallen from heaven, O Hilel, son of the howling morning? How are you cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Yeshayahu, Isaiah 14, 12. You will also find references to books that you may not recognize if you are an ardent, rather, if you are an adherent to the post-19th century, century Protestant Bible and its 66, 66 books. These citations include books such as the Sefer Yophalihim, Jubilees, 
the Sefer Chanak Enoch, the Seferim Baruch, the Seferim Ezdras Ezra, or the Seferim Maccabim. These books are called the Deuterocanon, or second books. Some of these books have been called the Apocrypha, secret writings. Over the years, these books have been excluded from the 66 books of the Protestant Bible. However, this exclusion cannot be justified historically. In the 2nd century BC, 70 rabbis translated 46 books from Ivrit, Hebrew, to Greek, a translation called the Septuagint, known as LXX. The LXX did not include the Sefer Chanak canon, rather Enoch, and the Sefer Yohev Ilim Jubilees. The LXX did not include the Seferim of three Maccabim and four Maccabim, Maccabees, because they were written in the period between 200 BC and 1 AD. In the first century, the early believers relied on this Septuagint as their source for sacred scriptures, and the writings of the Brit Chakadash, rather Chadasha, New Testament, also indicate that there was reliance on the Sefer Chanak, Enoch, Yovalim, Jubilees, and for Ezra, to Ezra. The first attempt to limit the books available to the believers happened at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. This council created 60 rules or canons. The 60th canon concluded that the books of the Old Testament which were approved to be read were 1. Genesis of the world, 2. The Exodus from Egypt, 3. Leviticus, 4. Numbers, 5. Deuteronomy, 6. Joshua, the son of Nun, 7. Judges, 8. Ruth, 9. Esther, 10. Of the kings, first and second, eleven of the kings, third and fourth, twelve chronicles, first and second, thirteen Esdras, first and second, fourteen the book of Psalms, fifteen the Proverbs of Solomon, sixteen Ecclesiastes, seventeen the Song of Songs, eighteen Job. 19, the 12 prophets, 20, Isaiah, 21, Jeremiah, 22, Baruch, 23, Lamentations and the Epistle, 24, Ezekiel, 25, Daniel. 42 books are individually counted, and this list includes Baruch and the Epistle of Jeremiah. The council then concluded that the books of the Brit Chadasha New Testament, which were approved to be read, were the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Acts of the Apostles, seven Catholic epistles, to wit, one of James, two of Peter, three of John, one of Jude, fourteen epistles of Paul, one to the, Ro one to the Romans, two to the Corinthians, one to the Galatians, one to the Ephesians, one to the Philippians, one to the Colossians, two to the Thessalonai Thessalonians, one to the Hebrews, two to Timothy, one to Titus, and one to Philemon. Twenty-six books were counted, and the book of Revelation was excluded. This first attempt at the canon canonized version of scripture included 68 books, not 66. Both the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Laodicea adopted the exist existing Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketevim, 
as the total text of the Old Testament in their rule, although the order was obscured around A.D. 100, Jewish rabbis met at the Council of Jamania, rather, Jamnaya, and decided to include only 39 books in the Jewish canon, because they were the only texts that could be found in the original Ivrit, Hebrew. Recall that three centuries earlier, 70 rabbis translated 46 books from Ivrit to Greek. The delineation of sacred scripture by rule or canon began to emerge in the late 4th century and early 5th century with the work of St. Jerome, also known as Eusbius. Jerome sought to limit the books of the Old Testament to the 39 books of the Tanakh. He was overruled, however, by Pope Damasus, who wanted all 46 traditionally accepted books included in the Old Testament. So the Latin Vulgate Old Testament was, fi was finalized with 46 books. The exact list of the books of the New Testament in the number and order in which they are traditionally delivered was set forth by Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria in a letter of A.D. 367, and Pope Damasus later ratified the same list. In A.D. 1536, Martin Luther, Luther translated the Bible from Ivrit, Hebrew, and Greek to German. He limited the Old Testament to only 39 books, put the extra books in an appendix he called the Apocrypha. He also removed the books of Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation from the New Testament order, declaring them to be less than canonical. In A.D. 1546, the Catholic Council of Trent reaffirmed the canonicity of, rather, the canonicity of all 46 books originally found in the Septuagint and reaffirmed the full list of 27 books of the New Testament as traditionally accepted. This canon is the last official canon of the Church. The original King James Bible carried a 39-book Old Testament 15-book Apocrypha, and a 27-book New Testament. The publication of only 66 books actually became an editor's option when publishers learned they could sell as many Bibles with only 66 books as they could with a Bible that included an Apocrypha. For many reasons, this method of inclusion and by default, exclusion, has relegated significant books to the dustbin. For instance, the justification for the elimination of the Maccabeum is not set forth in the, in the decision of the councils. The argument that the Maccabeum are merely historical ignores the extent that these writings answer many of the obscure prophecies found in Daniel 11. The Canon of Trent excluded Maccabeum Shalashi, three Maccabees, and Maccabeum Reverie, four Maccabees, Baruch Shani, two Baruch, and Ezra, Shalashi, and Revi, three and four Ezra, Chanak, Enoch, and Yova Hilim, Jubilees, were excluded from the Vulgate, and therefore excluded from all Protestant Bibles. These books appear as deuterocanonical works in various parts of the Christian world, however. For instance, both the Sefer Chanuk, Chanak, Enoch, and, Sefer, and the Sefer Yohavelim, Jubilees, appear in the Abyssinian sect as deuterocanonical works. While some historians have rejected Chanak, Enoch as heresy, 
Kepha Shani, 2 Peter, 2, 4 through 5, indicates that one of the believers in Chanak, Enoch, was Kepha himself. For he states, Elohim spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Sheol, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the wicked. The delivery into chains of darkness and the reservation unto judgment is discussed only in the Sefer Chanak, Enoch. The decision to include both of these books was made easier when Paleo Ivrit, ancient Hebrew versions of Chanak, and Yovelim, Jubilees, were found in Cave 4 at Qumram, rather Qumran, Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, the credibility of these two books, given the find, is much greater than the writings of the Brit. Chadasha, New Testament, where not a single original exists. The Sefer Chanak, Enoch, was clearly known to early Christian writers as the following quote from Chanak 2.1 indicates, In the seventh generation from Adam, Chanak also prophesied these things, saying, Behold, Yahuwah comes with ten thousands of his Kodeshim, to execute judgment upon all and to, convin and to convince all that are wicked among them of all their wicked deeds which they have wickedly committed and of all their hard speeches which wicked sinners have spoken against him. Yahuda, Jude 14 through 15. In Chanakin, rather, the... Chanakian writings, in addition to many other writings that were excluded from the Bible, such as the Sefer, Toviyahu, Tobit, Ezra, Baruch, and other books included herein, were widely recognized by many of the early church fathers as apocryphal writings. The term apocrypha is, is derived from the Greek word meaning hidden or secret. Originally, the meaning of the term may have been complementary in that the term was applied to sacred books whose contents were too exalted to be made available to the general public. In Daniel 12, 9 through 10, the text refers to words that are shut up until the end of time. And he said, Go your way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. Daniel, Daniel 12, 9 through 10. In addition, Ezra Rivei to Esdras, the text of which is contained herein, says the following. In 40 days, they wrote 204 books, 45, rather verse 45. And it came to pass when the 40 days were filled that El Elyon spoke, saying, the first that you have written, publish openly, that the worthy and unworthy may read it. Verse 46. But keep the seventy last, that you may deliver them only to such as be wise among the people. Verse 47. For in them is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom, and the stream of knowledge. Verse 48, And I did so. Ezra Rivei, 
rather, Ezra, Revi'i, to Esdras, 14, 44 through 48. Gradually, the term Apocrypha, books reserved only unto the wise among the people, took on a pejorative connotation as the orthodoxy of these hidden books was sometimes questioned. Origin, Calm in Matt, 10, 18, page 13.881, distinguished between books that were to be read in public worship and apocryphal books, because these secret books were often preserved for use within the esoteric circles of the elite believers. Many of the unenlightened church fathers found themselves outside the realm of understanding and therefore came to apply the term apocryphal to what they claimed to be heretical works and therefore forbidden to be read. In the Protestant world, the Apocrypha designated 15 works, all but one of which were Jewish in origin and mostly found in the Septuagint, that is, the Greek translation of Ivrit, Hebrew, and Aramaic text by the Seventy. There is a claim that parts of two Ezra are Christian or Latin in origin, and that four Maccabees was post-dated, although some of them were composed in the Levant or Aramaic or Ivrit. They were not accepted into the Jewish canon, Tanakh, formed late in the 2nd century A.D., Canicity, rather, Canonicity, 67, 31 through 35. The Reformers, influenced by the Jewish canon of the Old Testament, did not consider these books on par with the rest of the scriptures. Thus, the custom arose of making the Apocrypha a separate section in the Protestant Bible, or sometimes even omitting them entirely. Canonicity 67, 44 through 46. The Catholic view, expressed as a doctrine of faith at the Council of Trent, is that 12 of these 15 works in a different enumeration, however, are canonical scripture. They are called the deuterocanonical books, canonicity 67, 21, and 42 through 43. Many of the books were excluded due to discrepancies with the formulation of the Talmudic calendar a calendar which established a new year in the fall rather than in the, in the spring, as required in the Torah. Further, the Council of Trent did not have the benefit of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The books of the Protestant Apocrypha that are not accepted by Catholics are 3-4 through four Esdra, the prayer of Manasseh and three to four Maccabeum. The Protestant Apocrypha excludes also Chanak, Yehovelim, and Yashar. The theme of the Sefer Chanak, dealing with the nature and deeds of the fallen and the angels, so infuriated the latter, rather the later church fathers that one. Philastrius actually condemned it openly as heresy. Philastrius, Liber de Heresbius, number 108. Nor did the rabbis deign to give credence to the book's teaching about angels. Rabbi Shimon ben Jochai, in the 2nd century AD, pronounced a curse upon those who believed it. Delich, page 223. So the book was denounced, banned, cursed, burned, and destroyed, and last but not least, lost, and conveniently forgotten, 
for a thousand years. But with an uncanny persistence, the Safer Chanak found its way back into circulation two centuries ago. In 1773, rumors of a surviving copy of the book drew Scottish explorer James Bruce to Ethiopia. True to heresy, rather, true to hearsay, the Sefer Chanak had been preserved by the Ethiopic Church, which put it right alongside the other books of the Bible. Bruce secured not one, but three Ethiopic copies of the book and brought them back to Europe and Britain. When in 1821, Dr. Richard Lawrence, an Ivrit, Hebrew professor at Oxford, produced the first English translation of the work, the modern world gained its first glimpse of the forbidden mysteries of Shanak. Many scholars say that the present form of the story in the Sefer Shanak was penned sometime during the second century BC and was popular for at least 500 years. The earliest Ethiopic text was apparently made from a Greek manuscript of the Sefer Chanak, which itself was a copy of an earlier text. The original was apparently written in Semitic language, possibly paleo Ivrit, ancient Hebrew. The Lawrence text is the underlying basis here. Though it was once believed to be post-Christian, the similarities to Christian terminology and teaching are striking. Recent discoveries of copies of the book among the Dead Sea Scrolls found at Qumran prove that the book was in existence before the time of Yahushua, Hamashiach. But the date of the original writing upon which the 2nd century B.C. Qumran copies were based, is shrouded in obscurity. It is, in a word, old. Some historians claim that the book does not really contain the authentic words of the ancient biblical patriarch Chanuk. Since he would have lived, based on the chronologies in the Sefer Bereshit, book of Genesis, several thousand years earlier than the first known appearance of the book attributed to him. Such a conclusion would render the book pseudo epicurgo rather pseudepigraphal, pseudepigraphal, that is, of a pseudo-epigraph, attribution to an author not actually writing the book. Despite its unknown origins, many followers of Yahushua once accepted the words of this Sefer Chanak as authentic scripture, especially the part about the fallen angels and their prophesied judgment. In fact, many of the key concepts used by Yahushua Hamashiach himself seem directly connected to terms and ideas in the Sefer Chanak. Thus, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that Yahushua had not only knowledge of the Sefer Shanuk, but also respected it highly enough to ad adopt and elaborate on it, rather, on its specific descriptions of the coming kingdom and its theme of inevitable judgment descending upon the wicked, the term most often used in the Old Testament to describe the watchers. There is abundant proof that Yahushua approved of the Sefer Chanak. Over 100 phrases in the Brit Chadasha, rather the Brit Chadasha New Testament, find precedent in the Sefer Chanak. Another remarkable bit of evidence for the early followers of Yahushua's acceptance of the Sefer Chanak is found in an accurate translation of Luke 9.35 
describing the transfiguration of Messiah. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my Yahid, hear him. Apparently the translator here wished to make this verse agree with a similar verse in Matthew and Mark. But Luke's verse in the original Greek reads, This is my Yahid, the elect one, from the Greek, ho elikligemios, literally, the elect one. Hear him. The elect one is a most significant term, found 14 times in the Sefer Chanak. If the Sefer was indeed known to the apostles of Hamashiach, with its abundance descriptions of the elect one who would sit upon the throne of glory and the elect one who should dwell in the midst of them, then great scriptural, scriptural authenticity is accorded to the Sefer Chanak when the voice out of the cloud tells the apostles, this is my Yahid, the elect one, the one promised in the Sefer Chanach. The Sefer Yehuda, Jude, makes mention in verse 14 that Chanach, the seventh from Adam, prophesied Yehuda, makes reference in verse 15 of chapter 2, verse 1 of the Sefir Chanach, 2.1, where he writes, To execute judgment on all, to convict all who are wicked. The time difference between Chanach and Yehuda is approximately 3,400 years. Therefore, Yehuda's reference to the Chanachian prophecies gives credence to the idea that these written prophecies were available to him at that time. Fragments of ten Shanach manuscripts were also found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The famous scrolls actually comprise only one part of the total findings at Qumran. Much of the rest was Chanachian literature, copies of the Sefer Chanach, and other apocryphal works in the Chanachian tradition, such as the Sefer Yoholivin Jubilees. The Sefer Chanach was also used by writers of other apocryphal texts. The Chanachian story of the Watchers is also referenced in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs and the Sefer Yoholivim. Jubilees. The Sefer Shanach was in existence centuries before the birth of Hamashiach, and yet is considered by many to be more messianic in its theology than Jewish. It was considered scripture by many early followers of Messiah. The earliest literature of the church fathers is filled with references to this mysterious Sefer. Second and third century church fathers, like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Origen, and Clement of Alexandria, all made use of the Sefer Chanach. Tertullian, 160 to 230 AD, called the Sefer Chanach Holy Scripture. The Ethiopic Church added the Sefer Chanach to its official canon. It was widely known and read in the first three centuries after Hamashiach. In addition, there are references in this text from the Sefer Yovahilim, Jubilees. The Book of Jubilees in Ivrit, Hebrew, Sefer He Yovahilim, is sometimes called Lesser Genesis. It is an ancient Jewish, Jewish religious work. Until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the only surviving manuscripts of Yovelim, Jubilees, were four complete Gehaz texts, 
dating to the 15th and 16th centuries, and several fragmentary quotations in Greek, mainly found in a work by Epiphanius, but also found in others by Justin Martyr, Origen, Diodorus of Tarsus, Isidore of Alexandria, Isidore of Seville, Eutychus, rather, Eutychus, rather, Eutychus of Alexandria, Yohanan Malassas, rather, Yohanan Malalasas, George Senesilius, rather, George Sancellus, and George Candonas. There is also a preserved fragment of a Latin translation of the Greek that contains about a quarter of the whole work. It is considered canonical in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, where it is known as the Book of Division, Gehez, Metzach, Kafal, the Ethiopian texts, now numbering 30, rather 27, are the primary basis for translations into English. Passages in the text of Yovelim, Jubilees, that are directly parallel to verses in Genesis, do not directly reproduce either of the two surviving manuscript traditions. A further fragment in Aramith Syriac in the British Museum, titled Names of the Women of the Patriarchs, according to the Hebrew books called Jubilees, suggests that there once existed a Syriac translation. How much is missing can be guessed from the stichometry of Nicephorus, where 4,300 stichoi, or lines, are attributed to the Sefer Yehovelim, Jubilees, between 1947 and 1956. Approximately 15 Yehovelim scrolls were found in five caves at Qumran, all written in Ivrit. The large quantity of these manuscripts, more than for any biblical books, except for Psalms, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Exodus, and Genesis, in descending order, indicates that Jubilees was widely used at Qumran. A comparison of the Qumran texts with the Ethiopic version, performed by James Vanderkam, found that the Ethiopic was in most respects an accurate and literalistic translation. The Sefer Yovelim, Jubilees, presents the history of the division of the days of the Torah, of the events of the years, the year weeks, and the Jubilees of the world, as secretly revealed to Moshe by Yahuwah while Moshe was on Mount Sinai for forty days and forty nights. The chronology given in Jubilees is Hephetic, rather, heptatic, based on multiples of seven. The Jubilee year is the Shabbat year that follows periods of 49 years, seven year weeks, into which all of time has been divided. The Sefer Yasher, Jasher, is also set forth in this Et Sefer. The Sefer Yashar, Jasher, is mentioned twice in the Tanakh, the first time at Yahusha, Joshua, 10.13, and the second time at Shemuel, Shani, 2 Samuel, 1.18. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the Sefer of Yashar? 
So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. Yahshua, rather Yahusha, Joshua 10.13. Also, he bade them teach the children of Yahuda the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the Sefer of Yashar, Shemuel, Shinai, 2 Samuel, 1.18. The name Yashar is worthy of a darash, comparative meaning, discussion. Consider in comparison the name Yashuran, Jeshuran, and its use in Devarim, Deuteronomy. But Yashuran waxed fat and kicked. You are waxen fat. You are grown thick. You are covered with fatness. Then he forsook Eloah, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his Yahshua. Devraim, Deuteronomy 32.15 And he was king in Yashuran, when the heads of the people and the tribes of Yisrael were gathered together. Devraim, Deuteronomy 33.5 there is none like unto the El of Yasharan, who rides upon the heavens in your help, and in his excellency on the sky. Devarim, Deuteronomy 33.26 Without giving it to the world as a work of divine inspiration, or assuming the responsibility to say that it is not an inspired book, I have no hesitation in pronouncing it a work of great antiquity and interest, and a work that is entitled, even regarding it as a literary curiosity, to a great circulation among those who take pleasure in studying the scriptures. Noah Mordecai M. Preface to Sefer Jasher New York, 1840, reprinted in Authentic Annals, page XV. The account of the discovery of the Sefer Yashar begins when Titus destroyed Yerushalayim in A.D. 70. According to an account taken from the preface to the Hebrew edition of 1625, sometimes listed as 1613, as translated and included in the 1840 English edition, but omitted from the 1887 reprint, an officer named Sidrus discovered a hidden library, complete with a scholar hiding within. The officer had mercy on the man and took him and the books to his residence at what is now Sevilla, Spain but what was then called Hispalis, capital of the Roman province, Hispalensis, rather Hispalensis. The manuscript was donated to the Jewish college at Cordoba, Spain, and after printing was invented, the Jewish scholars had the book printed in Hebrew in Venice in 1625. There was also reportedly a 1552 Hebrew edition printed in Naples, but all of today's versions come from the 1625 printing. The transfer of the manuscript to Cordoba was mentioned in Mordecai Noah's preface. The Sefer Yashar was first translated into English by a Jewish scholar named Shemuel in Liverpool, England. He was in the process of translation when a fraudulent work, now known as Sedu, rather as Pseudo Jasher, a book on Hebrew ethics, was republished in English in 1829. Before Shemuel saw it, he published a letter stating that he was also translating the same book. Unaware that it was a complete hoax, by 1833, booklets were published 
to expose the fraudulent claims of pseudo-Jasher, making it difficult for him to publish the legitimate version in English. Because of the hostile British climate, Shemuel sold his translation to Mordecai M. Noah, a New York publisher, and it was published there in 1840, away from the scandal. It was the first English translation of the Sefer Yashar ever published. The Sefer Yashar contains many authentic Hebrew traditions. Hugh Nibley, for example, stated after quoting material about Chanak from Yashar 3, 5 through 10. Passages such as this, which closely follow both the Hebrew and the Slavonic Chanach, show that the book of Yashar used very ancient sources and was far more than a medieval romance. Collected Works of Hugh Nibley, Volume 2, page 301, FN 380. It is definitely not a modern fiction, as was the 1751 book of the same name. Ginsberg, in his landmark collection, Legends of the Yahudim, quotes from it freely, and it is listed in Jewish encyclopedias as an authentic source. The Jewish Encyclopedia, New York, Funk and Wagnall, 1905, XII, 588 through 9. The Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, New York, Universal Jewish, Jewish, rather, Universal Jewish Encyclopedia Company, 1942, 641. The Safar Yashar is a set of annals which appear to have been handed down through a series of authors. Nowhere is there any implication that it was all one big revelation given to a prophet in the manner that Genesis was given to Moshe. Shemuel, the translator of the 1840 edition, maintained that this book is indeed the book mentioned in the Old Testament. He concludes that the book is, with the exception of some doubtful parts, a venerable monument of antiquity, and that, notwithstanding, that some few additions may have been made to it in comparatively modern times, it still retains sufficient authenticity to prove it a copy of the book referred to in Yahshua, rather, Yahusha 10, and Shemuel Shani 1. These are the two places where Yashar is quoted in the Old Testament. The Sepharim of Ezra are also necessarily included in order to consider the initial realization of the famous prophecy set forth in Daniel 9, where reference is made to the additional books of Ezra, Esdras. Although not belonging to the canon, Ezra Shalashii, rather, Ezra Shalashi, three Ezra, is made up almost entirely from materials existing in canonic, canonical books. Ezra Shalashi, three Ezra, provides a history of the temple from the time of Yoshihayu, rather, Yoshiyahu, Joshua, down to Nehemiah, Nehemiah, and was freely quoted by the early fathers, and included in origins Hexapala, rather, Hexapla. The Sefer Ezra, Rivi E for Ezra, also reckoned as two Ezra, is often called the Apocalypse of Ezra. This remarkable work has not been preserved in the original Greek text, but has been found in Latin, Syriac, Arabic, two independent versions, Ethiopian and Armenian translations. The, the body of the book the unity of which appears to be unquestionable, rather unquestionable, is made up of seven visions, 
which Ezra is to have seen at Babel, the thirteenth, rather, the thirtieth year after the destruction of Yerushalayim at the hands of the people of Babel. Sefer Ezra, Revi for Ezra, is reckoned among the most beautiful productions of Hebraic literature. Widely known in the early Christian ages as frequently quoted by the fathers, it may be said to have framed the popular belief of the Middle Ages concerning the end times. Another Sefer referenced herein is Baruch Rishon, one Baruch, also known as the Prophecy of Baruch. Baruch Rishon presents a certain unity in point of subject matter, so that most of those who maintain that the whole work was written in Ivrit, Hebrew, admit also, admit also its unity of composition. Contemporary critics believe that the work was a complementary process and that its unity is due to the final editor who put together the various documents which centered upon the Jewish exile. This method of composition does not necessarily conflict with the traditional authorship of the Sefer Baruch Rishon. Many of the sacred writers of what is commonly considered the Bible were compilers and Baruch may be numbered among them. While the prophecies of Baruch are important to this book, the Apocalypse of Baruch, also known as Baruch Shanai to Baruch, stands out as vital. A. F. J. Klinge writes, Until recently, the Apocalypse of Baruch was only known from a Syriac manuscript dating from the 6th or 7th century A.D., since the beginning of this century, two fragments have come to light in Greek, 12.1 through 13.2 and 13.11 through 14.3. From the 4th or 5th century, small fragments of the text, again in Syriac, have been discovered in lectionaries of the Jacobite Church. However, no fewer than 36 manuscripts are known, because it once belonged to the canon of scriptures in the Syriac speaking church. In this text, there are other changes of substance in the Brit Chadash, Chadasha, the New Testament as well. One change is made in Matthew 23.1. Originally, the text read as follows. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All, therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Matthew 23, 1-3 The Mitzvah of the New Testament presents an interesting conundrum for those who believe in the inerrancy, rather, inerrancy of Scripture, as it directs the believer to observe whatever the scribes and Pharisees bid. An explicit read puts the believer at odds with the remaining context of the chapter. A more careful review indicates that the word they was actually the word he. The second sentence provided that people should not do after the takanat, reforms, and the ma'asim, traditions, of the parashim, Pharisees. We made the following correction. Then spoke Yahushua to the multitudes and to his Talmudim, saying, The scribes and the parashim sit in Moshe's seat, all therefore whatsoever he bids you guard, that diligently guard and do. But do not ye after their reforms and traditions, for they say and do not. Matthew, Matthew 23, 1-3 A review of the passage found in Romaim, Romans 10, 4, 
also revealed a more complete phrasing to correctly display the meaning of the text. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Romans 10.4 The word that became an issue was the word telos. Strong's Greek Dictionary 5056 provides that the word telos is derived from a primary telo to set out for a definite point or goal. Properly, the point aimed at as a limit, that is, by implication, the conclusion of an act or state, termination, literally, figuratively, or indefinitely, result, immediate, ultimate, or prophetic, purpose, specially, an impost or levy, as paid, continual, custom, and ing, finally or uttermost, as a result of a review, the correction was made, rather, the correction that was made reads as follows. For Hamashiach is the goal of the Torah, for righteousness, to everyone that believes. Sefer Ramim, Romans 10.4 This text also includes a passage of scripture known as Acts 29. T.G. Cole, writing in 1801, said this about Acts chapter 29. In bringing to the notice of the Christian public the document known by the name of the long lost chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, we felt that we are fulfilling a duty to Christ and rendering a service to our fellows. In all probability, not 1% of Christian believers, not to speak of the general public, have ever heard of the Sonini manuscript. Yet, how many earnest believers would be delighted to have corroborated it, rather, rather, to have corroborative evidence of the visit of the great apostle to the other people of, the, of these lands. The document referred to purports to be the concluding portion of the Acts of the Apostles and gives an account of Paul's journeys after his two years enforced residence in Rome in his own hired house. It is written in the style of the Acts and reads like a continuation of it. It was found interleaved in a copy of manuscripts from Sonini's travels in Turkey and Greece, and purchased at the sale of the library and effects of the late Wright Hahn, Sir John Newport Bart in Ireland, whose family arms were engraved on the cover of the book, and in whose possession it had been for more than thirty years with a copy of the Furman of the Sultan of Turkey, which granted to C.S. Sonini an original Greek manuscript, which was found in the archives at Constantinople and was presented to him by the Sultan Abdul Ahmet. In Sonini's work, the English translation of the document was found. Travels in Turkey and Greece undertaken by order of Louis the Sixteenth and with the authority of the Ottoman court by C.S. Sonini, member of several scientific or literary societies of the Society of Agriculture of Paris, and of the observers of men, Mores Mortorim, Videt et Ubs, Hor London, printed for T. N. Longman and O. Rees, Patermaster, Row 1801. The claim in the 29th chapter of Acts is that Sha'al, Paul, traveled into Spain, surviving his trial before Nero. We rely on three witnesses to corroborate this chapter. First is a statement from the moratorium fragment from the 5th century. What, 27, marvel is it then, if John, 
so consistently, 28, mentions these particular points also in his epistles. 29, saying about himself, What we have seen with our eyes, 30, and heard with our ears, and our hands, 31, have handled, these things we have written to you, 32, for in this way he professes himself to be not only an eyewitness and hearer, 33, but also a writer of all the marvelous deeds of the Lord in their order, 34. Moreover, the Acts of the Apostles, 35, were written in one book, 4. Most excellent Theophilus, Luke compiled, 36. The individual events that took place in his presence, 37. As he plainly shows, by omitting the martyrdom of Peter, 38, as well as the departure of Paul from the city of Rome, 39, when he journeyed to Spain. Paul intended to travel into Spain. Consider his discussion in Romain, Romans 15. But now having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. Sefer Romain, Romans 15, 23-24 Finally, the third witness is found in Acts 28, which, unlike the other scriptures of the New Testament, does not end with the resounding Amin. This difficulty is cured with the addition of the 29th chapter. The most interesting correction in this text, however, is the correction made in Chazayan, Revelation 13.8 which restores the original Greek letters to what has been interpreted for the last 400 years as 600, three score, and six. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, Three score and six. Chizayan, Revelation 13, 18. However, there are no numbers, but rather rather the three Greek letters X E rather the the three Greek letters Chi Xi Stigma Gi Z Stigma rather Ki Z stigma. These letters in Strong's Greek Dictionary 5516 are defined as the 22nd, 14th, and an obsolete letter 4742 as a cross of the Greek alphabet intermediate between the 5th and 6th used as numbers denoting respectively 600 60 and 6, 666 as a numeral, 600, 3 score, and 6. Stigma, Strong's Greek Dictionary, 4742. From a primary stizo to stick, means a mark incised or punched for recognition of ownership, that is, figuratively, a scar of service or mark. For example, a stigmata or in another instance, to stigmatize. We elect to restore the actual picture of the mark as it was seen by Yahu Kanan, John. The phrase gets even more complicated when you consider the translation of the term arithmos as number, according to the Thayer and Smith. Greek lexicon entry for arithmos from the New Testament Greek lexicon. The term arithmos means both 
a fixed and definite number and an indefinite number or a multitude. Some have described the x in the algebraic equation x plus 1 as being the arithmos, for instance. The avrit Hebrew word found here is sefer. This term also means number in this application. The alaftav. One ivrit Hebrew word which has escaped translation in all English texts is the word et, which is spelled in the ivrit as aleftav. The alef is the ox head, the symbol of strength, and is often construed as a crown of leadership. And the tav, an X or cross, means the mark. The aleftav combination stands 9,392 times in the Ivrit Tanakh Old Testament and 531 times in the Brit Shadasha, rather the Brit Kadasha New Testament. Ivrit translation from the Greek Textus Receptus and does so in each instance without the benefit of translation. It is our election, therefore, to include all of the Aleph Tavs that show up in the text in the Tanakh. And the 531 times the Aleph Tav shows up, Evrit translation from the Greek Textus Receptus, in the text in the Brit, Brit Charasha without benefit of direct translation. For example, in the beginning, Elohim created at the heavens and at the earth. Barashith, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was at Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. Yahu Khanan, John 1.1. 1, 1. I am the Aleph, and the Tav, the beginning and the ending, says Yahuwah, Elohim, which is, and which was, and which is to come, Yahuwah, Sabaoth, Chizayan, Revelation 1.8. These, then, are the corrections in the Et Sefer. It is our most fervent prayer that these are found true and pleasing to Yahuwah, Elohanu, Yahuwah, our Elohim, that they would come to bless you in your pursuit of the truth to which you were called.